The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Isaiah places together the most unlikely combination of creatures, the hunter and the prey, the powerful and the meek, the strong and the vulnerable. Each creature has a perceived rival, a foe that can destroy and consume its being. The words of Isaiah are words of hope. A peaceful land is possible. Paradise is in front of us. Israel one day will live in harmony with its enemies. Fear not. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The paradise of God is a place of harmonious coexistence. The great irony is that the fulfillment of Isaiah's words would be found in the one who was vulnerable, the Messiah. Christ was vulnerable with his enemies to a fault. Jesus allowed himself to be placed at the hands of his adversaries. He was judged on their terms, and he was put to death by them. In the divine person of Christ, God made God's self vulnerable, and through the resurrection, God showed the surprising reversal of weakness. And by contrast, we as a nation attempt to fortify ourselves, to use our power and might to secure our lives. We want to be invincible to threats from beyond our borders and threats from within. And these wishes are human. They are rational. We want to be free from fear, unencumbered by worries about enemies, foreign or domestic, liberated from viruses that restrict social interactions and threaten our health. We want to be restored to paradise, but sometimes it's for the wrong reasons. Rather than simply living in a garden of splendor and safety, we are tempted to have another go at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If we could re-enter the garden of Eden to claim the fruit of the tree of life, we imagine that this time, this time we will get it right. We will know how to use such knowledge for good. We somehow imagine that if we could go back in time, a corrective, would be secured. This time, we would bring about a different outcome. If we were to go back to a place where we would be, have been, we would know the terrain. We would be able to see more clearly. We would be able to find our way. We would not make a mess of things. We would choose wisely. If we could go back in time, maybe we would make different choices. Perhaps we would have just invade Afghanistan and leave Iraq alone. Or maybe we would avoid a military conflict in either. Given another try, maybe we would resist the forbidden fruit of self-reliance and trust that God will provide what we need. Paradise does not allow us to have a bite of the fruit that makes us invincible. We are not in this earthly body invincible. Paradise is laid out before us with limits and we are to trust that there is more than this moment. 
Our redemption is found not in our strength, but in our vulnerability. And unfortunately, we have yet to grasp the teaching of Genesis 2. We are not to eat from the, true of, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As humans, we are to resist the temptation to provide all the solutions for the challenges that we face. We are to trust that God is the source of wisdom. God is the way, the truth, and the life. God desires for us to enjoy what we receive. And the blessings that come to us may not be what we imagined. The blessings may not be all that we want, but the blessings we are given will suffice. When we cease to believe this truth, we find ourselves hopelessly holding half dreams that squander whole lives. Once we are outside the garden of paradise, looking in, we see what we miss and we want to return, but we cannot find the way. Grief overtakes us, anger blinds us, and discouragement crushes us. Yesterday, yesterday we replayed the tragedy and the trauma of September 11th, 2001, and why a 20-year anniversary of that infamous day somehow is more poignant than the 19th, I do not know. But yesterday was a hard day. When a professor from Fordham University was being interviewed on CNN, she shared her opinion that the 9-11 period is over. She was referring to the fact that our nation has withdrawn our troops and removed our embassy from Afghanistan. 9-11 was our reason for invading Afghanistan. The towers fell, the plane in Shanksville crashed, the Pentagon was attacked. We attacked, occupied, and now have left Afghanistan. And all those events have reached their conclusion. But something about that professor's comment shook me into real time. The 9-11 period is over. We have spent a significant amount of time a significant amount of emotional energy memorializing what was for those of us who experienced it an unforgettable day. And to our youth who were not even born at the time, we keep telling them, never forget, know your history. The confirmation class that is asking to join the church today None of them were alive when 9-11 happened. Consider this, where were you in 1965? For those of us who were alive. What were you doing? What were you thinking? And what history did you commemorate at that time? And if you were not alive, what have you worked to never forget? What history do you recall? I'm not referring to Vietnam, the Civil Rights Act, or the war on poverty. Who among us in 1965, and there were some, but who among us took time to commemorate the ending of World War II? There is a temptation to have at the center of our being those harrowing moments when we were on the precipice of life and death. It's not necessarily a matter of our choosing. It's, it's, it's hard to leave that zone. But life moves forward. We do not walk backwards. We face our future. Our lives are in front of us. It's true for all of us. We have precious.
precious time before us. Memories tug at us. Sorrows and joys tear at us. And we want to process, we want to have a little more time to process what we have. We want a little more time to process something we shared, something we knew together for good or ill. There's a point in time when we are to accept that we have periods in our lives that come to an end, but there is more. The conclusion of one period creates an opportunity for another. And the writer of Ecclesiastes summarized this by saying, I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before God. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. We have had the past, and now we have the future. That which has been is fixed. Nothing may be added to it or taken from it. Now we move on into a new day. Our lives are before us. Life moves onward. While we may yearn for the good old days of simplicity, there never were such days. We always have been subjected to hostile people, warring madness, economic uncertainty, crippling diseases, and pandemics. Nevertheless, through such time, we live into hope. We rely on the mercy of God to usher in a new day. Instead of praying, take me back, God, please take me back, perhaps we should be praying, take me forward, God, please, God, take me forward. Take me forward to the time when Christ will come again, when adversaries will not hurt or destroy on God's holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we are cognizant of this 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks of 9-11, and we pray that you will grant us the wisdom to remember the lessons from that tragic day that make us more Christ-like, drive away from us any vengeful urges, any hate-filled sentiment, any whisper from within or without that goads us to return evil for evil. And as we look back and recall where we were, who was with us, and how we felt that fateful day, may those vivid memories compel us to acts of kindness, words of love, and demonstrations of community. And may the myriad images of helpers Firefighters, police officers, pastors, office workers, ordinary citizens inspire us to be helpers too. And may texts and voicemails of I love you and you are everything to me assure us that love always has the last word, but that we should never wait to say it. We pray for those whose lives were forever changed on September 11, 2001. Grant comfort to those who grieve, strengthen those who struggle with questions that remain unanswered, and assure those who worry that they should have said or done something differently that you gather up all the fragments of our lives 
you bless and use those fragments in ways that nourish. We are reminded, oh God, in real time of our vulnerability that continues to this day and beyond. We pray, oh God, for those who love the five who were on the Navy helicopter who died. We give thanks and are struck by the willingness of those brave souls to give their lives for ours. And for the survivors who were injured and the survivors who miss their friends and family, we pray for health, healing, and solace. Oh God, as we walk on dry land, it's hard to imagine the waters that raged and creeped into our cities and streets. And you have assured us that waters will not overtake us. And we are comforted that you swiftly receive the souls of those who perish. We pray, O oh God, for those who continue and will have a long patch of finding a new home, those who are in the path of Ida, those who are in the storms in Mexico, those who are in the earthquake in Haiti. Yours is a promise of resurrection, O oh God. May it be so. May it be so. And now, God, we give you thanks for the sorrow that we feel this day. For the discouragement that we have because Rick and Melanie are leaving. Were it not for our love for them and the lives that we shared with them, we would not hold such feelings in our hearts. And so we give you thanks for our heart ache. We ask your blessing on them as they establish a new home and as they befriend those who will welcome their presence. We give you thanks for the decades we shared, not only with them, but with Jeff and Brian and Scott. And we're so grateful that we had a little more time so that we could meet Chelsea and Kelsey and Sarah, Isaac, and maybe one day, Neil. Bless their lives as new homes are established. We pray, O oh God, your blessing upon our church family. We are trying to continue to celebrate each day, and yet it is hard because the rules keep changing. Help us to live within the limits and enjoy the splendor. We offer these prayers in the one your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And on the evening of his arrest, Jesus gathered with those who loved him. And on that occasion, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, 
This is my body which shall be broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed with my blood. As long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of our Lord until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us enjoy the feast. Has everyone received a communion packet? And I will remind you that the way to get to these elements is twofold. Uh, the little tab, you push down, you pull up, there's a, there's a little thin film on the top. So I invite you to remove the top layer. And friends, believe it or not, this is the body of Christ. And if you bend down and take up, uh, bend down until you hear a click in the tab, and carefully pull that open, you might be able to take off. And you might not. <laughs> Friends, this is the cup of our salvation which shall make us whole. But let us pray once more. <laughs> Loving and gracious God, you bind us together as we remember in whose hands we have placed our trust, Jesus Christ our Lord. We yearn for the day when we will be in full communion. We give thanks, O oh God, that even though Judy Du Bois is not able to be with us here today, she has returned home, and we pray, O oh God, that you continue to allow her to experience a fullness of healing. For all those who continue to be cautious and, and feel like we, we might be these vectors of germs, O oh God, let us respect their need, and may we remain in touch. And as we receive these elements today, O oh God, let us do so in proxy for those who are near and those who are far. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, let us sing a hymn we fortunately don't sing that much. It is hymn number 444, and I think it's obvious why. Um, we gather here today.
face of God shine upon you and give you peace. For we are God's children. We are forgiven.